the biology of hooch. So as you can see, I have upgraded a little bit as per some feedback I received on the first episode. For starters, I have this fancy lab coat that I made. Oh, look at my pretty lab coat. Oh, it's so pretty. Also, I bought a whiteboard because whiteboard. And our beverage of choice today will be bourbon and coke because I think that works out very nicely. Just a note, I am of legal drinking age. Um, I probably should have said that in the first video. Our topic today will be discussing ethanol, or hooch, where it comes from, and how it affects the human body. So we're going to start with ethanol. Now, ethanol is a two-carbon chain with this hydroxyl group right here, which is what defines an alcohol. Ethanol is also known as grain alcohol. This is different from, say, methanol, which is called wood alcohol, and can also make you blind. Methanol kind of looks like this, but that is a three, and that doesn't exist. So ethanol is produced through a process called alcoholic fermentation. Alcoholic fermentation is a way for smaller organisms, because bigger organisms don't really do that, to generate energy in the form of ATP. It's not horribly efficient, and it doesn't always involve alcohol. Uh, it can involve things like butane diol or other stuff. Deviations. The ethanol is produced by an organism called Saccharomyces cerevisiae, or as you might commonly know it as, I'm gonna pretend that sentence worked out, also known as yeast. And it has a very similar effect to what you see here. We're going to be exploring those effects a little bit later in the video, because that's kind of the part about ethanol that everybody is interested. Just as a side note, uh, fermentation actually has some pretty interesting uses. Uh, I keep reading up on more and more experiments that involve um, like butadiol producing algae and things like that for uses in making plastics and diesel and other oil based organic molecules. So we're going to give a quick overview over the various types of hooch. I'm not going to spend horribly long on this because this is pretty well documented in other places. First, we're going to talk about vodka. Vodka is probably the easiest one to talk about because it's essentially ethanol and water. It is what's called a neutral grain spirit which means they took like potatoes or wheat or for those other people living in Michigan you see that St. Julian's is making a vodka out of grapes you know things like that they throw in the yeast they boil it for a bit blah 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 and you get something around 35 percent ethanol by volume. Gin, one of my favorite types of hooch, is essentially infused vodka. You take the grain spirit and you turn it into steam and you pass it through a bunch of different flavorants. The big popular ones are juniper which give it gives it that pine tree taste and citrus and cardamom and all sorts of things. And then there is our American favorite whiskey. Whiskey is essentially made through the same process. You take grains, you turn it into a mash with the boiling water and so on and so forth, add some yeast, all of that fun poo. A process very similar to brewing beer, for that matter. But you age it in wooden barrels, and that's what gives it the nice 
well, I mean, this has Coke added to it, but it gives it the nice brown color and everything like that. And there's a lot of different rules for types of whiskeys. There's bourbon, scotch, Irish blended, so on and so forth, but that's for a different time. And if you don't really understand the idea behind wine, I don't think I can help you. So now we're going to talk about the biology of hooch, like the video says. So ethanol is primarily absorbed through the small intestine. You ingest it orally, you know, when you drink it. Delightful. And then it moves through your stomach where no real absorption occurs and then into your small intestine where nearly all of the absorption occurs. Now food in your stomach will slow down this process, especially lipids, because the alcohol bonds to the lipids in an ester bond. Lipids being like oils and fats and so on and so forth. But really that just kind of slows down the process and doesn't necessarily stop it. So whenever some dude says this is a way not to get drunk, they're probably not fully correct. Okay, just between you and me, they're lying to you. But now that we know where it enters your body, we need to know how it's processed. The big one is the liver, because the liver processes nearly everything that goes through your body. The liver breaks it down using various intracellular processes. There's cytochrome P450s, which we'll talk about more in just a second. There are peroxisomes, which handle the radical oxygen species that come from breaking down the ethanol, like peroxides and so on and so forth. And there are a couple of other mechanisms as far as that goes, but we don't really need to know those for this purpose. Now your liver can adapt to various amounts of ethanol, but this is a slow process and probably not a really good one for you. Do as I say, not as I do. Now back to our good friends, the cytochrome P450s. Cytochrome P450s handle a lot of different foreign materials, including pharmaceuticals. The main reason they tell you not to have alcohol when you're taking medicine is because the cytochromes will behave differently or the pharmaceuticals will behave... Behave? Not so much behave. They'll have a different confirmation, which leads to different behavior. Okay, we can just say behave. Long story short, alcohol changes how the medicine interacts with the cytochromes. It might absorb too quickly, it might absorb too slowly, which can either be ineffective or toxic. Your liver is very good at repairing yourself because it handles toxins, but you don't want to risk hepatotoxicity or for the uninitiated, liver sickness. Because you got this whole liver thing here and it's got like the different lobes and all of that and it's like, oh, the ethanol can come in and we'll process it and it'll go out and everybody will be happy. But alcohol doesn't just interact with your liver. And just to be specific, when I am saying alcohol, I mean ethanol and not like methanol or isopropyl alcohol, also known as rubbing alcohol, you know, ooch. But ethanol also interacts with your kidneys. Your kidneys process all of the liquids passing through your body. Kind of incorrect, but it'll do for now. The big thing to know about is a hormone called antidiuretic hormone, ADH, or vasopressin, depending on who you ask. Ethanol inhibits ADH. And if you know what the definition of diuretic is, and how antidiuretic 
would act, well, you know where this is going. Basically, it makes you pee more. This should not be a surprise. But what is getting drunk? Getting drunk is when you are consuming ethanol faster than your liver can process it. Or you can, you know, excrete it or breathe it out. Because you actually do get rid of some ethanol by breathing. When this happens, the ethanol enters your bloodstream because it's getting past your kidneys, getting past your liver, all of that fun poo. And that's when we get to your BAC or your blood alcohol content, which is what the cops are measuring when they pull you over. Well, the big thing to keep in mind is when the alcohol is entering your bloodstream, then we start getting into the central nervous system. The CNS has what's called the blood brain barrier because your brain is very sensitive to things that don't belong. This is especially uh, related to bacteria and foreign matter, chemicals like ethanol. And what you notice when you're getting drunk is the ethanol entering various areas within your brain. So, like, if this is a very poorly... Wow, my whiteboard's upside down. So if this is a very poorly drawn version of your brain, when the ethanol enters, say, the cortex, especially the frontal cortex, where a lot of the higher processes happen, that's when you start lowering your inhibitions and being less in control of your emotions and saying things that you probably shouldn't like well I'm sure everybody has had that moment and then it enters areas like your hippocampus that's when you start having memory loss that's also referred to as blacking out there's also areas like the occipital lobe where your vision starts having trouble that may also have to do with the various areas because if this is your eye it has to pass all the way through your brain to get to the occipital lobe. You have the temporal lobe right around here where you start having the fuzzy hearing, all of that. But this guy over here, that's of special interest because that's your cerebellum. That controls coordinated movement, balance, and a lot of your motor functions as far like the like the higher motor functions. When the alcohol hits this guy, that's when you start tripping over yourself. This drawing is looking really ugly. But the big one to be careful of is when it starts entering your brainstem down there. Your brainstem houses something called the medulla oblongata. If it's hitting the medulla oblongata, ethanol is capable of disrupting functions like a regulated heartbeat, autonomic breathing, all of that fun stuff. And it kind of leads to a bad case of death. You should probably not be drinking to that extent. And at no point does drunk science advocate that behavior. Side note, for the sake of responsibility, a way you can avoid that is by being properly hydrated and try not to consume more than one drink per hour, which is the rough amount that your liver can handle. So that about sums it up for this video. I can't promise when the next one will come out because hooch is expensive, but I will be taking suggestions for what to cover next in the comments section. You guys have a good duration of time until I see you next. Bye!